Sorry, Madam, uh, once a foreign area. Um, Kaspersen, uh, John Commander, Al Mu, Jusaku Yamura, and Scott Kimball. And we've got a couple team members uh, back home that have also helped that are here uh, working on our vision stuff, uh, Sayed, and, and uh, also uh, I'd like to introduce our uh, advisor, Dr. Eric Johnson. And uh, with that, I guess I'll uh, go ahead and get into the meat of the presentation here. A little bit of an overview. Um, our air vehicle, you've been introduced to it already. Uh, it's this uh, coaxial design we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, we'll go through a little bit of the guidance and control stuff, talk about the payload that we're carrying on board, and, uh, and then talk about how we do some of our, some of our operations. The airframe, uh, we decided to go with the commercial off-the-shelf uh, system uh, built by this guy. Uh, it's, a, it's a fun little uh, coaxial helicopter. It's a little bit, a little bit larger than the uh, than the, the CX2 that most people are familiar with. Um, the stock unit runs about 410 grams. After modification, ours is about uh, 600, a little over 600 grams. And the propulsion system is uh, is the 46 centimeter rotor uh, coaxial design. We have upgraded the stock system uh, to, to use brushless motors, and we power it with a uh, with a LiPo running about 1320 million pounds. That seemed to be a good, kind of a sweet spot in, in the battery weight to, to, um, to efficiency that we found. So this is the actual vehicle itself, and we've got it up here if anyone wants to take a look at it. Um, the, some, of the, some of the nice features that we've included, uh, we, we built this safety shroud around the outside to take care of, uh, to take care of any sort of um, safety issues that might come. This is carbon fiber uh, sandwich structure that, that we designed specifically for this vehicle. And it will allow uh, you know, gentle brushes with obstacles without uh, causing any rotor strikes, which is, which is really convenient when you're, uh, when you're testing new systems out. We have uh, infrared sensors, the sharp infrared sensor uh, that, that uh, was mentioned uh, by Henry Riddle. We're using the, uh, the medium range one that, that ranges from about uh, 20 to 150 centimeters uh, for obstacle avoidance and for heading control. We've got a sonar on board for, for altitude, and the, the avionics are packaged up underneath the bottom. And we've got a camera out in front to, uh, to do all of our, our vision processing. So for guidance navigation and control, we decided to go with a system that is uh, passively stable, rather than try to, uh, to jump right in on our first year with, with any sort of uh, you know, active control IMUs and whatnot. We thought that a, a nice, uh, uh, coaxial design would, uh, would provide us that stability. So our system uses the, the, the typical bell stabilizer you see on, on the coax the RC helicopters. And we've also included a heading lock gyro for yaw stability. The standard rate gyro on board uh, was, was not good enough for what we wanted to do, so we upgraded that as part of our brushless motor upgrade as well. And so we've got, uh, for, for guidance and control, we have a standard PID controller uh, that, that you uh, were briefed on a little bit earlier, and we've got the gain scheduling on there to uh, to allow us um, a little bit more control over over how the games are scheduled. And the column filter was described earlier, and uh, the paper's going to be available if you want more detail on that. <coughs> so our primary payload, uh, we have we have two main sensors. Uh, the uh, Sharp infrared sensor, which is used for heading control. We've got two in the front that are face forward, and uh, whenever we see a wall or, or an obstacle in front, it can calculate a heading based on the difference between those two sensor readings. And they're also used to, to measure the distance to that object. We've also got left and right looking sensors to, to look down the wall in either direction to give us an idea of, of what's coming ahead as we, as we fly. Our basic tactic is to uh, use wall following behavior so the vehicle can basically trace the outline in the building and get around in that manner. Then if we're out to, we're using a, a sonar, this uh, Maxbox, uh, which you probably all, are all familiar with if you did uh, any research into the sonar. It has a, a nice range uh, from about uh, six inches out to, out to around um, 250 inches or so, and we use that primarily for altitude. Payload, uh, we have a um, a vision sensor on board, it's just a typical NTSC camera. We're using a frame grabber on the ground to capture images at uh, 320 by 240 at 30 frames per second. And those images are processed looking for the blue LED. Um, and we have capability, we haven't implemented yet, but to do some optical flow kinds of things that those are on the horizon for us. Um, we haven't implemented them this year, but they're, they're in the works. Uh, for 
communications. We're using uh, the, a 900 megahertz uh, radio system for the transmitter for the video so that we don't interfere too much with DXBs. And uh, the data link is running on 2.4 gigahertz, um, the XB Pro 60 milliwatt transmitter. And then our safety pilot is basically an RC uh, hobby transmitter. And it's running 2.4 gigahertz as well. And that is interfaced uh, through an off-the-shelf system that allows us to switch between the hobby radio and the the XB or the data link. We're running a ground station that allows us to fly through a joystick interface and then for the kill switch basically the, the pilot or the judge would, would flip the switch and take over the vehicle at that point. And if the throttle is at zero, it would kill it. If we have it you know, somewhere around hover, it would just take over and, and the judge can, you know, can do whatever with the vehicle, uh, depending on the situation. The, Microcontroller on board. We, we've used a, an Atmega 120E chip. It's basically an 8-bit microprocessor running at running at 16 megahertz. And one of the nice features about it is that it has a few uh, PWM outputs that we can use to control the servos. So that was one of the features that we took advantage of. And uh, we're also using uh, the analog to digital capability to read the IR sensors. And one of the serial ports is used to read the sonar. The other one is used for communication. And we've also got an SPI bus on board for adding uh, additional sensors later on. We've got uh, pressure sensors and gyros and things like that that are all running SPI that could be added onto the vehicle for added capability in the future. <coughs> Our primary operations are taken care of by the ground station. I've got a couple of pictures here in a few minutes, but we basically can see the vehicle position and velocity estimates plotted in real time on the graphic interface and the, um, the status of the data link and the autopilot uh, switching can all be done right there from the ground station. And it's really nice because all of the system variables that, that we can see on the ground station can be recorded and, and reviewed later so that uh, if you wanted to go back and look at the sensor data or to try to figure out why the, the vehicle did a particular behavior, we can see why, uh, why it made the choices it did in terms of deciding when to turn or when, or when to fly you know, in different directions. And we can go back and, and analyze that after the fact. And this is a picture of the ground station. Uh, we basically have a command line, um, the command line area up here. These different windows can be used to view different system parameters. Here we have all of our gains that can be adjusted in flight. Um, then we can see all of the, the messages that are going up to the vehicle, messages coming down from the vehicle. And here we're plotting uh, all the, the sensor data and all the, the estimates in real time. And you can see those, see those you know, during the flight and record those for, for later use. So, I mentioned the camera earlier. Uh, we're basically recording images in real time um, at about 30 frames per second. We're analyzing those as they go through, looking for this blue LED. And what we've got is a series of different uh, parameters that are used to give us a confidence level on a particular image. So, like for instance, in this picture, this, this image shows a couple of different LEDs here and a simulated gauge. And it's picked out this, this blue in here and given us a confidence level. Uh, number here, and that number will change depending on the lighting and the angle to the LED and those kinds of things. We can use that information to basically score a particular image, and once it's above a certain threshold, you know, we'll say that that, that, that is the image you know, that, that we've detected the blue LED. And all those parameters can be adjusted for the lighting conditions and whatnot, so it will vary depending on, you know, depending on the light and the conditions, but we can, we can adjust all those ahead of time. So I've got a little video here. This is a flight test where we are basically uh, beginning with altitude control. So we'll, we'll take off and then turn on the altitude controller, and it'll it'll come to a nice altitude there. And so the controller is the controller is on now, and then it comes down to an altitude, and then we'll implement uh, the uh, wall distance uh, controller where it will fly over and keep a steady distance to the wall. And this in this particular flight test, the uh, the pilot is in control of the lateral motion and the vehicle is controlling the heading and the distance to the wall. So this was an earlier test where we were, we were checking, uh, closing different loops to see, uh, to tweak the different parameters. So we basically, the, the operations were to uh, close loops and check uh, gains, adjust gains, and then uh, incrementally add more and more functionality. We also have a nice simulation, uh, which I'll show you in just a minute. You saw a little bit of a video earlier from it. But what's really nice about our simulation is that we can run exactly the same onboard code 